mean, as I, as I said, over this set of halaqas, inshallah ta'ala, this set of a few, you really get to understand how Islam came to Medina as a whole. And so far, we have covered the last full episode of season one was of course Mus'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Mus'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu being paired off with the first amongst the Ansar. Who was that man? I want these names to be so automatic to you that you could rehearse this throughout Ramadan the way that you rehearse or recite surahs of the Qur'an. So who's the man from Medina, first person? Oh, please don't do this to me. We just talked about him a couple of weeks ago. As'ad ibn Zurara, the first Muslim from Medina is As'ad ibn Zurara radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, leads the bay'ah, gives his allegiance to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then brings back the Ansar to become the Ansar that we know them. Then Mus'ab and As'ad are in a place together and as they are starting to teach these people Islam, there's a man that comes to the gathering angry, upset, and As'ad tells Mus'ab, if this man becomes Muslim, a lot of people are going to become Muslim. So make sure that you, you get this one right. Who was that man? Usaid ibn al-Hudayr, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, we spoke about. So this is, it's all coming from this garden, right? As'ad, Mus'ab, and Usaid ibn al-Hudayr comes. Now, the person who sent Usaid ibn al-Hudayr was the man that we are talking about today, inshallah ta'ala, and from just the pure virtue perspective, the virtues of this man are truly unique in that the things that the Prophet ﷺ said about this man in terms of his miracles, he did not say about any other companion. You know, when you talk about the firsts in terms of the first achievement or the first person to do this or that, there are many of those, but there are very few people who have these virtues that are unique to them, and the Prophet ﷺ did not mention them for anyone else, and that is the man that we're talking about tonight, Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So I want you to understand something, inshallah ta'ala, again, from the uh, build-out from As'ad ibn Zurara. As'ad ibn Zurara was from what tribe? Anyone remember? There's Aws and Khazraj. Okay, so he's from the bigger one. Which one was the bigger one? Khazraj is the bigger one. So As'ad is from Khazraj. Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh is from Aws, the other tribe. But he is the maternal cousin of As'ad ibn Zurara. Okay? Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh is actually his cousin through the mother of As'ad ibn Zurara. So there is a maternal link there. And these are two men that are looking to end what has happened after the Bu'ath wars, after so many people have passed away in Bu'ath. Inshallah ta'ala, I just want to remind the kids not in front of the camera, inshallah ta'ala. So remember that it was these young men that wanted to end it all, right? So you have Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh and you have As'ad ibn Zurara. Now Sa'ad sends Usaid ibn Hudayr to this gathering with As'ad ibn Zurara because he says, listen, if I show up there, it's going to be a scene. It's going to be fitna because we're cousins and this is going to be an Aws and Khazraj thing. So he said, why don't you go there, see what Mus'ab and As'ad are doing and put an end to this nonsense, right? Usaid ibn Hudayr goes, Usaid ibn Hudayr comes back to Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh looks at him and says, Wallahi, he's coming back to us with a face different than the one that he left with. Something happened to him. He's been transformed. Now, this is where we enter into the picture of this man, Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, as we said, is from the Aws tribe, from the Aws tribe. And he is the son of a man by the name of al numan So Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh ibn numan So Mu'adh ibn numan who was, of course, one of the leaders of the tribe, uh, died prior to this incident. So he is someone that has perished in the battles that took place before. Remember, this is the case of all of these Ansar. On the mother's side, he's the, uh, the son of a woman by the name of Kabsha bint Rafi'ah. And she was from one of the Jewish clans, Banu al-Harith, of the Khazraj tribe. Okay? So his mother was from Khazraj. And this is, again, where you start to see the relationships taking place. Now, he is married to a woman by the name of Hind bin Simak. And this was uh, the widow, actually, of his older brother, Aus, who was named Aus, who passed away. And they had two sons, Amr and Abdullah. Uh, his son, Amr, remember we said As'ad ibn Zurara, his lineage uh, did not continue. Uh, 
As for Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, he had a son, Amr, who had nine sons. So the lineage of Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh actually is quite vast. And there are many people that trace their lineage back, tribes later on that trace their lineage back to this man, Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So he's related to As'ad ibn Zurara. He is related to Usaid ibn Hudayr. And when he converts to Islam, as we'll see, his mother, his siblings, his wife, his children, they all convert to Islam as well. So you go back to this incident, right? Now, Sa'ad is considered the senior amongst them. And remember, being the senior amongst them doesn't mean you're that old. How old do you think he was? He's about 31 years old. Okay? He would have been about 31, and he's considered their elder. Okay? Senior, uh, known for his presence, and really looked towards to bring peace to Yathrib after all that had happened. Sa'ad was a wise man. He was a person that immediately commanded respect in a gathering. And this is a description of Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu in that regard that when Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh walked into a gathering, he was a sayyid. You knew, you knew that he was a leader amongst the people. He had a presence to him radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So remember, he was the one that sent Usaid ibn Hudayr to go check on the gathering and stop this. Usaid comes back, and here's what Usaid ibn Hudayr does. Does Usaid come back to him and say, you know, I think you should listen to what Mus'ab has to say. I think you should go and listen as well. No, actually, Usaid ibn Hulayr, he comes back to him and he says, Awaqad sami'at? Did you hear? He said, no, what are you talking about? He said, did you hear? He said, no, what are you talking about? And he said, there are these people from Banu al-Harith and they want to do such and such to your cousin, As'ad ibn Zurara. So remember, he sent Usaid to check on the gathering and to put an end to what As'ad ibn Zurara and Mus'ab were doing because he didn't want to make it a thing by him going himself. Usaid now is playing on his attachment to his cousin and he's not telling him exactly what's happening but he's making it seem like, some, like someone has apprehended his cousin, like something bad is happening to As'ad ibn Zurara. So what does Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh do? Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh goes rushing towards that place to now save As'ad ibn Zurara. He gets there and what does he find? He finds As'ad ibn Zurara with Mus'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu and they're still teaching the people Islam. Mus'ab who just, you know, you know, just earlier that day, Usaid was coming with his sword to, or, or his spear to take care of him and angry and As'ad ibn Zurara said, that man is coming. This is a Sayyid from his people. If you, if you do well with him, then a lot of people are going to become Muslim. Now you've got Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh walking towards Mus'ab, angry as well, wanting to do harm to him. And Asad is like, this man is even <laughs> higher up, right? So know how you're going to approach this man, be patient. And Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh just makes the assumption that Mus'ab is part of this plot against Asad. He comes into the gathering angry. What is going on? Mus'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu says to him, nothing is wrong. Why don't you have a seat? And just listen to what we have to say. And if you don't like what I have to say, then I'll be out of here. But at the same time, just give it a chance. Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad sees that As'ad is okay and Mus'ab has won him over already. He puts his weapons down, he sits down, he listens to him. Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad says, this is beautiful, how do I become Muslim? So Sa'ad embraces Islam right away. All right, so Mus'ab has won over in that same span of time, right? Usaid and now Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So Mus'ab explains to him the process Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu goes, he does ghusl, he comes back, he takes shahada, he prays two rak'ahs, and then he goes back to his people. SubhanAllah, when he comes back to his people, they say about him, Sa'ad is coming back to us and his face has changed. <laughs> like what's happening? We keep sending people over there and they're coming back with their faces changed. Like the same look on his face that Usaid had, like Sa'ad is back now, and he has that same look on his face. He's come to us with a different expression. Except Sa'ad is going to do a different approach. Okay? Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu is not going to, uh, you know, take anyone else with him at the moment. Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he stands up. And he says, Ya Bani Abdul Ashhal. He calls out to his people. Remember, he's the leader of his tribe. Ya Bani Abdul Ashhal. So they all gather around him. Remember when the Prophet Sallallahu stood on Safa called his people to him. Just so you can see the difference between the people in Medina at that time and their readiness, right? And what did the Prophet do? He called them to remember 
his qualities. And the Prophet ﷺ has the greatest qualities, al-sadiq al-ameen, right? The truthful and the honest one. So he says, Ya Bani Abdul Ashhal. And they say, Labaik, we're here. He says, Kayfa ta'lamuna amri fikum? How do you see me amongst you? It's common in those times, by the way, that a chief will want to hear his praise just because, right? But this is for a different reason. So they say, Sayyiduna wa afdaluna wa aymanuna naqiba, the best of us, the leader of us, the most trustworthy of us. You are the one that we look to for all of our affairs. Now, what does he do with them? After he acknowledges those nice words, Sa'ad radiallahu anhu says, then listen up. Inna kalamakum alayya haram wa rijalakum wa nisa'ukum hatta tu'minu billahi wa rasulihi. He said, listen, not a single one of you speak to me ever again until you believe in Allah and his messenger. It's like, whoa, where did this, where did this come from? So this is his way of, of imparting urgency upon them. Like you just mentioned your dependency upon me as your leader. He says, I am not going to talk to any of you or come near any of you, your men or your women, until you believe in Allah and His Messenger So they're, they're kind of shocked by the statement. It was meant to provoke something inside of them like this is urgent. And so they asked him, what does it mean to believe in Allah and His Messenger? What are you talking about? And so he conveyed to him the Islam that he learned in those few moments. There's something that Allah put that was special in that place. And so at that time, in that moment, in that one gathering, ما بقي من بني عبد الأشهر رجل وامرأة إلا مسلم أو مسلمة. Every single person in that gathering became Muslim. Instantaneously. This is all happening in the same day. So it started off with Mus'ab and As'ad, few, a handful of people, then Usaid ibn Hudayr, and now the chief of Aus. And the chief of Aus went back to his people, and his people have all embraced Islam in the same day. And there's one more person, which is Sa'd ibn Ubadah, radiallahu anhu, who we'll talk about next week, inshaAllah ta'ala. And that sort of completes all of Medina. As'ad and the two Sa'ads, you get all of Medina. <laughs> Just like that. So after that, Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu ibn Mu'adh, he comes back. So he leads to a, this leads to a mass conversion in Medina. Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu is one of those who comes back to take bay'ah with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, bay'ah to al-Aqaba, to take the pledge of Aqaba uh, with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he is appointed as a naqib as well. He is appointed as a chief as well. Now Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu, uh, in this situation, there's an interesting incident that happens. Sa'ad, and it was common that some of the leaders of Medina, of Yathrib, had ties to some of the leaders in Mecca. Okay? Uh, you'll see this with the two Sa'ads. Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh and Sa'ad ibn Ubadah next week, that they had some connections with some of the very same people that were oppressing the Prophet So Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, when he went there, he says to his trade partner and his friend, who is none other than Umayyah ibn Khalaf. Umayyah ibn Khalaf was his key trade partner. When Umayyah used to come to Medina, to Yathrib at the time, Sa'ad was the one that would be his host. And when Sa'ad comes to Mecca, He's hosted by Umayyah ibn Khalaf. Now, Umayyah ibn Khalaf is not a very good person, right? Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that's all you have to say, right? The, the tormentor of Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu, a man who carried out all sorts of atrocities and persecution against the Muslims. But here, right, Sa'ad is using his alliance and he says to him, listen, he says, what's a time that the Kaaba is empty, that the Haram is empty? Because I want to go do Umrah, right? They're still maintaining that trade partnership. Remember, these people were opportunists at the end of the day, right? Uh, you know, in Mecca, not the Muslims I'm talking about in Mecca. So he said, look, give me a time that I can go and do Umrah in peace. Umayyah, who's stopping Muslims in Mecca from doing Umrah, right, from worshiping Allah and persecuting them, he says, yeah, I've got you, don't worry. So he finds a time for him around Dhuhr, as you can imagine, that's a time where it's pretty hot, right? And he says to him, just come on, you can go and you can do tawaf and do what you have to do. So Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu comes, Umayyah walks out with him. Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu is doing tawaf and Abu Jahl comes out. And he calls out to Umayyah, Ya Aba Safwan, who's this person? So Umayyah ibn Khalaf says, he's Sa'ad ibn Mu'ath, like calm down. Abu Jahl looks at Sa'ad. And he said, you think you can walk around in safety in Mecca after having given safety to our fugitive? 
You go and you shelter our people that have fled from us and you think you can uh, do tawaf around our Kaaba here when you shelter these people who have changed their religion and you support them, you claim to be from their supporters. And he says, Wallahi, if you weren't with Abu Safwan, meaning, meaning Umayyah, he said, I'd make sure that you never, your family never sees you again. Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he stands up and he goes up to Abu Jahl and he says to him, Wallahi, if you tried, if you dared to try to stop me from making tawaf, he said, I would stop you from something that is even more valuable to you. He said, I'd cut off all of your trade caravans to Asham. Your trade would go nowhere. Caravans would be done. So they get in each other's faces. They're about to fight. Umayyah now has to show his loyalty to Mecca again, right? So Umayyah takes the side of Abu Jahl. And he says, لا ترفع صوتك على أبل حكم. Don't you dare raise your voice on Abu Hakam. They call him the father of wisdom, not the father of ignorance. فَإِنَّهُ سَيِّدُ أَهْلِ الْوَادِي He is the chief of the people of this valley. And then Sa'ad starts to argue with Umayyah. And Sa'ad says to him, to Umayyah, his friend, he says to him, you are a fool for insisting on this way. He says, فَإِنِّي سَمِعْتُ مُحَمَّدًا صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ يَزْعُمُ أَنَّهُ قَاتِلُكُ you know, He said, you know, I heard Muhammad وسلم, say that he's going to kill you. Umayyah, and remember, these people know that the Prophet وسلم, is truthful. They know he's truthful. They know that what he has is divine. So Umayyah stops and he says, Iyai? He said, wait, Muhammad وسلم, said he's going to kill me? Sa'ad says, yes, like wake up, you know? You persecuted him all these years, we took him in. I can't help you, I'm your trade partner. But the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that your death is imminent. So what does he do? He says, Wallahi ma yakdibu Muhammadan idha hadith. Umayyah says, if Muhammad ﷺ said that, he's not lying. He's telling the truth. Umayyah goes home, says to his wife, Ya Umm Safwan, you know, guess what Sa'ad said to me? She said, what? He said that Muhammad Sallallahu has informed them that I'm going to die, that I'm going to be killed fighting against them. So she said, well, don't ever leave Mecca. <laughs> don't go fight him, right? It's common sense. And that's why when Badr happened, Umayyah actually did not want to go out. He actually stayed back, was trying to stay back in Mecca. And what happened? Abu Jahl went and taunted him in front of everybody, stirred him up, and got him to go out in Badr, right? where both of them would be humiliated, right? Abdullah bin Mas'ud standing on the chest of Abu Jahl at the end of that battle, Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu standing on the chest of Umayyah ibn Khalaf, just as the Prophet sallallahu had promised, right? But subhanAllah, at that moment, he didn't, because of that incident with Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he did not want to go out to Badr, because he knew that the Prophet sallallahu does not speak lies. And even when the Prophet sallallahu saw them coming, saw the other side, he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that you know, there are some people amongst them that are not the same. And he says, some of them were just forced to come out with their people. They really were hesitant. They did not want to fight this battle better. Abu Jahl was the arrogant one, the one beating the drums of war, literally. Right? And he said that if there's anyone that's doubtful, hesitant, it's in that man. And he pointed to Umayyah. Right? Knowing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, knowing that he was forced out. SubhanAllah, look how arrogant these people were to insist upon their ways to insist upon their idolatry, to insist upon their persecution, knowing that the Prophet ﷺ does not speak a lie. So he's saying to Sa'ad, he was sobered from that incident. He said, you know, if, if Muhammad ﷺ said that, I'm done, right? Then I'm actually going to be killed. So Sa'ad was trying to wake him up. It did not happen. Now, the other part of this is that Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu plays a crucial role in Badr, a crucial role in Badr, okay? SubhanAllah, it's in this that you see the quality of a person. Now, who is greater, As'ad ibn Zurara or Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh in terms of the leadership of the Ansar? Actually, As'ad, but As'ad is dead, remember? He died right after the Hijrah. Okay, so that's why As'ad ibn Zurara does not live to see Badr. He's the first Janaza, right, in Islam. So, Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh is now the de facto senior of the Ansar as a whole, okay? It's between Aus and Khazraj, but Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu is looked to as the senior most respected person amongst the Ansar now that As'ad ibn Zurara radiallahu ta'ala anhu has passed away. So the way he goes in Badr 
is going to largely determine the behavior of the Ansar and Badr as well. Now remember, just to give you some context here, Badr was not a planned battle, right? The Muslims were trying to interrupt the caravans of the Meccans going to Asham, who had stolen their stuff and were going and buying and selling it in Asham, tra trading with it in Asham. And Abu Sufyan ambushed the Muslims. Badr is not in Medina, it's far away from Al Medina. He ambushed the Muslims by actually reading where they were going to plot and then amassing this humongous army to go and to take care of them. So the Muslims were not equipped for a battle here. They didn't have horses, they didn't have camels, they didn't have the weapons of war. You know, they were not ready for this. The Meccans, on the other hand, were fully prepared. They're coming with a much larger army and more camels, more horses, more weapons to take care of them, to wipe them out. So when that happens, the Prophet ﷺ has a choice. The Prophet ﷺ can do his best to flee or the Prophet ﷺ can occupy the most strategic position that exists in that, in that wilderness, right? And prepare for them. So the Prophet ﷺ chooses, of course, to occupy the wells of Badr because that gives them a strategic advantage to have the wells there. They could get there first before that large army from Mecca will arrive. However, the Prophet ﷺ does shura, consults with the companions that are around them. So he's sitting with the Sahaba, and I want you to imagine this now. Muhajireen and Ansar, this is your first test, your first major test together, right? The Prophet ﷺ says, Ashiru alayya ayyuhan nas. He says, O oh people, what do you think we should do? Ashiru alayya means, let's hear some opinions, right? So when the Prophet ﷺ says that, this is where, and I'm going to bring back this incident, Miqdad radiallahu ta'ala anhu speaks, and Miqdad was from the Muhajireen, right? Miqdad is from the people of Mecca. And Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, Shahidtu min al Miqdad ibn al Aswadi mashhada lan akuna sahibahu ahabbu ilayya mimma udira bihi. He said there was this incident, that time, I'll never forget when Miqdad stood up, when the Prophet ﷺ was sitting with us in Badr, and I wish I would have done it, like I would do anything. I trade the whole world to be the one who said what Miqdad was going to say. So he stands up, and if you remember, Miqdad has a booming voice. Very, you know, loud, strong voice, a presence. He said, لا نقول كما قال قوم موسى اذهب أنت وربك فقاتلا We're not going to say the way the people of Musa said, go you and your Lord and fight. We're going to be on your right and on your left and in front of you and behind you, Ya Rasulullah. Go ahead, we've got you. So Ibn Mas'ud said, I looked at the face of the Prophet وسلم, and he said, Like the Prophet's face opened up like a big smile. Like subhanAllah, to see that confidence and that, that love and support, but that's ultimately still coming from the Muhajireen, it's the people of Mecca. Now, after the fourth, the Prophet ﷺ still says, Ashiru alayya ayyuhan nas. So what do you think we should do, O people? And then Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he gets the hint. He says, Wallahi laka annaka turiduna ya Rasulullah. It seems like you're speaking about us, O Messenger of Allah, meaning the Ansar. And the Prophet ﷺ says, Naam, I'm talking about the Ansar. I know I've got the Muhajireen, we've been fighting for 13 years, right? But it's as if you're speaking about us, the Ansar. Why? This is such an important point. The Ansar could have walked away from Badr and not fought on the side of the Prophet ﷺ, and there would have been no blame on them whatsoever because the bay'ah, the allegiance that they took to the Prophet ﷺ, the pledge that they took was that they would fight defensive battles in Medina against the enemies that are coming. So technically speaking, Badr could, could be ex, you know, excluded from that bay'ah. And the Prophet ﷺ knows that, and he's not going to force them and say, okay, forget about what we said. We're in Badr now, we're at we're the outskirts of Medina, we're fighting our enemies. The idea was, we'll defend you in Medina. This is not in Medina. By the way, the Ansar made up more than two-thirds of the people that were there. <laughs> So if they would have turned back, this would have been awful, right? I mean, it would have been a much smaller group of people. But look at the justice of the Prophet ﷺ. He doesn't force them. He doesn't force them. 
The Prophet is honoring the pledge that they took. So when Sa'ad radiallahu anhu says, Ka'annaka turiduna, it seems like you're talking about us. Asad is dead. Sa'ad is the one who holds Liwa al Ansar. He's the one who holds the banner of the Ansar. And he says, Yes. Sa'ad radiallahu anhu says, Ask for us. Faqad amanna bika wa saddaqnaak wa shahidna anna ma jitta bihi huwa al haq wa a'atinaaka ala thalika uhudana wa mawathiqana. He said, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. We believed in you, O Rasulullah. We have, we have followed you. We have witnessed, borne witness, that what you have brought forth is indeed the truth. And we've given you our pledges and our covenants on that premise. Ala sam'i wa ta'a, to hear and to obey. And he goes a step further than what Miqdad says. He says, فَمْضِي يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ لِمَا أَرَتْ فَنَحْنُ مَعَكْ Go, O Messenger of Allah, and do what you're going to do. We are with you. He says, فَوَالَّذِي بَعَثَكَ بِالْحَقِّ By the one who has sent you with the truth. He said, if you were to go into this bahr, if you were to go into the ocean, فَخُطَّهُ لَخُضْنَاهُ مَعَكْ If you went and fought in the middle of the ocean, we would take our army and we'd go right in there with you, Ya Rasulullah. We would follow you into the water to fight these people. Not a single one of us, he's speaking on behalf of the Ansar now, not a single one of us would leave you hanging. All of us, over 200 of us, by the way, out of an army of 313, all of us will be right there by your side. And nothing, you know, we, we, are not look, we are not trying to get out of meeting the one who has opposed you, Ya Rasulullah, in any way. We are happy. And we are patient in war, but we are vicious in battle. Meaning, you'll see the Ansar, we are strategic. But once we get into the trenches, Ya Rasulullah, we're going to be fighting with you. You're going to see a side of us that you have not seen. We will fight, and we will fight strong. وَلَعَلَّ اللَّهَ يُرِيَكَ مِنَّا مَا تَقَرُّ بِهِ عَيْنُكَ and it may be that Allah is going to show you something, O Messenger of Allah, from us, meaning the Ansar, that is going to be the coolness of your eyes, that's going to bring joy to your eyes. Fasir bina ala barakatillah. Go ahead, O Messenger of Allah, with the blessing of Allah, and take us wherever you want to take us. The Prophet ﷺ had so much joy in his face. Like, this is my group of people, these are my companions. You know, the Muhajireen and the Ansar. That moment from Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu is why he earns the nickname Siddiq al-Ansar. He's the Siddiq, the truthful one of the Ansar. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu was the Siddiq of the Ummah. Right? He is the truthful one of the Ummah and of course he's from the Muhajireen. But the truthfulness of Sa'ad radiallahu anhu in the most defining early moment of Islam to express that level of confidence and then to make that an identity of the Ansar. And this is basically equivalent to the role that As'ad played in the Bay'ah. Remember with the Bay'ah, there's like a hesitation here. Not a hesitation of, you know, we're not sure, but like who's going to be the first one to do this? And As'ad is the one who gives the confidence on behalf of the Ansar and pushes them all forward to go and take that pledge with the Prophet ﷺ. Now that As'ad has died, it's Sa'ad. And Sa'ad is the one who stands up on that day and because of the stand of Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu, you saw the entire attitude of the Ansar that we are going to be there with you, Ya Rasulullah. We're not turning back from this. So subhanAllah, that is the quality. When, when you read about these people in Badr, right? And they are the veterans of Islam, right? They are the veterans of Islam. The best of us are the best, are, are the people of Badr. And this was maintained throughout the history of Islam, right? As long as anyone from the veterans of Badr was alive, they were noted amongst the people. They were noted in the gathering. This is why, this was the quality of these people. To the point that Jibreel alayhi salam said what? Ya Rasulullah, how do you view the veterans of Badr amongst you? And the Prophet sallallahu said, the best people amongst us are the veterans of Badr. Jibreel alayhi salam says, amongst the malaika, we celebrate the veterans of Badr. The, the angels that fought on the day of Badr are considered the best of the malaika. They're considered the best of the angels. This is the quality of those people and they were lined up behind people like Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu. 
In Uhud, Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Siddiq al-Ansar, the truthful one of the Ansar, once again, he rises up and he's one of those who does not leave the side of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's one of those that sticks with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa like we mentioned the Usaid, throughout the entire battle of Uhud and suffers multiple wounds on his, on, on his behalf. Sa'ad radiallahu anhu actually is the one who narrated, if you remember in the story of Mus'ab, Mus'ab radiallahu anhu made noises to take the army away from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He attracted attention to himself. He basically invited his own death in Uhud when he saw that they were about to ambush the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh was the last person to see Mus'ab ibn Umair radiallahu ta'ala anhu do that to strike up the dirt and to make those noises and to attract and pull the army towards him radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He went to the side of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa on that day. And Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu uh, was amongst those, by the way, whose, uh, whose brother, Amr, as well as his stepson, Al-Harith ibn Aus. Remember we said Sa'ad married the widow of his older brother? Uh, so the son, the stepson, Al-Harith ibn Aus, was, was, uh, was someone who was older because he was uh, you know, old enough to fight in that battle. He was amongst the shuhada of Uhud. So two of them, Sa'ad's brother, as well as his stepson, are amongst that group of people that were martyred at Uhud. Now, also remember the story where the Ansar were deeply, deeply grieving from the Shuhada of Uhud, right? And so what they used to do was the practice of niyaha. Niyaha was to grieve. I mean, literally to, to wail out loud. You would grieve in front of your home. You would call out the name or, you know, you, you would show your anguish at the death of the person that you lost. And at that time, niyaha had not yet been made haram. And if you remember... Who was the Prophet ﷺ most sad about after Uhud? After Uhud? Hamza radiallahu ta'ala. Sa'ad was the one who saw the Prophet ﷺ come out and he saw the Ansar, their families in the streets of Medina, all crying over their dead ones. And the Prophet ﷺ put his head down and he said, Where are the Bawaki? Where are those who cry over Hamza? Sa'ad was the one who noticed that and who heard that. And Sa'ad, I'm talking, the Ansar were such different people, subhanAllah. You, you have to love them for Allah. It's ibadah, so you have to go into Ramadan with this, honestly, right? Sa'ad was the one who gathered the Ansar then in front of the house of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they all started to cry over Hamza, right? To show the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa your pain is our pain, ya Rasulullah. We're in pain over our loved ones, but we know what Hamza meant to you. We too are going to come, and we're going to cry uh, by your side. And after that, niyaha was made forbidden. And the scholars say that's one of the honors of Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that he was the last person in Islam that it was permitted for, that the people would, uh, would, would lament him in this fashion and weep uh, loudly at his death. So he's played a pivotal role now in the hijrah, in opening up the doors in al Madina. He's played a pivotal role in Badr. He has played a pivotal role in Uhud. And his most pivotal role is actually in al Ahzab. It's actually in the next battle and the last battle that he would be a part of. Now remember in Al-Ahzab now, this is after Uhud, all of the armies have gathered to wipe out the Muslims. Okay? They've come from all over to wipe out the Muslims and of course they built the trench, the Khandaq. Now, what makes matters worse, of course, far worse, is that they realize as they built the trench that they were also betrayed from the inside. So they not only had to worry about from the enemies from without, they had to worry about the enemies from within. The Prophet ﷺ comes to know that Banu Quraiza is plotting against him وسلم, and actively coordinating with the outside to attack from this side while they attack from the outside of the trench. This is a catastrophic situation. Catastrophic situation. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, إِذْ جَاءُوكُمْ مِنْ فَوْقِكُمْ وَمِنْ أَسْفَلَ مِنْكُمْ وَإِذْ زَاغَتِ الْأَبْصَارِ وَبَلَغَتِ الْقُلُوبِ الْحَنَاجِرِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, remember when they came to you from every direction and your eyes were, were, were wide in horror and your hearts were in your throats. That's how afraid you were, right? At the situation, once you know, I mean, you spent all this time trying to build a protection mechanism from those on the outside and you come to realize that you're actually going to be attacked from the inside as well. The Muslims could not afford a lapse in the trench. 
it would literally be the end of them, right? Because if the Meccans could penetrate in any way into that trench, they were going to wipe out everybody. And so every part of the trench had to be manned. And they're running out of food and drink, and they're under siege in Medina, and now Banu Quraida is plotting against them. Now, this situation is particularly close to the heart of Sa'd ibn Mu'adh because Sa'd ibn Mu'adh was the leader of Aus, and Aus had an alliance with Banu Quraida. So uh, basically, Sa'd radiallahu anhu is very close to Banu Quraida. He knows them, they trust him, he has been part of holding all of the tribes together, holding this peace in Al Madinah. And now Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu understands that Banu Quraida has betrayed the Prophet and is seeking a way to attack the Prophet from the inside. So the Prophet he calls a Sa'dan, the two Sa'ds, Sa'd ibn Mu'adh and Sa'd ibn Ubadah. And the Prophet is asking for advice as to what to do. The Prophet uh, come, you know, he, he says, you know, what if we were to make a deal, for example, with one of the tribes, Ghatafan, uh, to actually, uh, you know, if they break their pact with Quraysh, then we will give them a certain share of our crops in Al-Madinah. Like the Prophet ﷺ is thinking about negotiation things, and the two Sa'ds basically say to the Prophet ﷺ, that, Ya Rasulullah, this is not going to work with them, and you have our support, we'll figure it out. Right, we'll figure it out. So Rasulullah sends them, the two Sa'ds, to investigate the situation, to sort of go back inside al Madina now and to dig deep into what is happening. So Sa'd goes to Banu Quraida and they let him in. Okay? They love Sa'd. They stand for him. They let him in. They invite him into the fortress. And Sa'd radiallahu anhu pretends to not know anything. So when they get comfortable, they start to say to Sa'd, you know, remember the old days before these people came from Mecca and this man came from Mecca and ruined everything between us? You know, if only it could go back to those days and in fact, we'll take it back to those days. They start to make their threats very clear and sort of, you know, in their comfort with him, they're basically confirming to him that we've got, we've got something up our sleeves, but Sa'ad, like, you'll be okay, we've got your back. Right? Like, you know we love you, and remember how it used to be before Islam came and corrupted all of this, before it messed up all of our power structure and all this stuff? Like, you know, let's take it back to the old days. But they're, they're in a way, by even letting him in on that, they're kind of saying, like, don't worry, you know, we'll take care of the, the, the heads, our old friends and our allies in this regard. So Sa'ad just plays along. He doesn't say anything. Comes back. And he says to the Prophet or he informs the Prophet what had happened. Now, subhanAllah, that was actually prior to the moment that Banu Quraida started to actually attack. And uh, there are a few things that happened there. The women were, in the, were, were, were actually in a fortress, right? So the women and the children were the first, the most accessible people to Banu Quraida at the moment. And Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she was with the mother of Sa'd ibn Mu'adh. Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh comes to visit his mother and as Sa'ad is leaving, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she says, SubhanAllah, I remember saying to his mom, I wish he wore armor on his arms as well. Because Sa'ad was wearing a body suit, but his arms were exposed. His, the, the shield, the armor that he was wearing, the body armor that he was wearing was sleeveless. And Aisha was saying to the mother of Sa'ad, I wish he would cover his arms as well, like be a little bit more careful with everything that's taking place. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would decree that he would indeed be struck in the place that his armor was not covering. So Aisha was remembering, recalling those moments in the fortress where she had said to the mother those words. Now, Banu Quraida, did they try to attack the women? They actually did. They actually did attack the women and the children. However, there is one woman that rose, and you can go back and listen to her biography, Innaha Safiya, Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib, the aunt of the Prophet Sallallahu Does anyone know who, who's, who was her son? Az Zubair, the mother of Az Zubair radiallahu anhu. Remember? Ibn Safiya. Right? Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib was, was a strong, strong, strong woman. Okay? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to say about her, Innaha Safiya, right? Like she's something else. She is something else. And you know what? She showed it that day because when Banu Quraida approached, Hassan ibn Thabit radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he's a poet, he's not a warrior. He was with the women and the children. So when they were coming, they're like, 
looking at Hassan ibn Thabit to go do something, Hassan ibn Thabit saying, I froze up. Right? As Banu Quraida is approaching. Safiya, she went behind the door. The first man that came in, she popped him with a pole, and then she picked up his body and threw it out. And when they saw the man's body thrown out, they all ran away because they thought that that the army was actually there in the fortress, that they read their plot and that they foiled it, and they thought there was probably going to be a bunch of warriors there. It was just Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib that averted that crisis, right? But the point is, is that, you know, Banu Quraidah had really transgressed every single limit here, right, in, in this treason, in trying to attack the Prophet ﷺ from inside. And subhanAllah, Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh he was, um, uh, as he was, he was uh, leaving, uh, this is where a man by the name of Ibn Ariqa, Ibn Ariqa, uh, threw a spear at him from a distance, and it struck him in his arm, okay? And when it struck him in his arm, he says, خُذْهَا مِنِّي وَأَنَّ بْنُ عَرِيقَ He said, take it from me, and I am the son of Ariqa. Ariqa, of course, means sweat. Ariq means sweat. So Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu responded, he says, Ariqa bika fil nar, may you sweat in hell. But that strike to his arm uh, obviously popped something because they said that the blood started to squirt uh, from, it's from the upper arm of Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu, so it struck something that was significant. And Sa'ad radiallahu anhu basically started to bleed out, okay, from the strike. Now, subhanAllah, in that moment, he could have died. But his dua was very interesting. I want you to listen to his dua. And this is just the sidq, the truthfulness of a man. As he's struck and as he's you know, reasonably about to die in that moment, and the people are coming to tend to him and try to patch him up and keep his life. He looks up and he says, Allahumma, O oh Allah, in kunta abqayta min harbi Quraysh shay'a, if you have willed that there is still any battle left with Quraysh, fa abqini laha, then let me live to see that battle. Fa innahu la qawma ahabba ilayya an ujahidahum min qawmin aadhaw rasulak. He said, I would not love to fight a people more than them because they hurt your prophet and they expelled him from his land and they belied him. SubhanAllah, he's saying, Ya Allah, I'm about to die, but Ya Allah, if there is anything left with those people, this is his love for the Prophet Right? This is not ego. These people used to kill each other over what? The names of their tribes. Right? He's saying, if there is anything left from fighting Quraysh, Ya Allah, let me live to see the very last battle with Quraysh because of their hurt for the Prophet And Allah would will it, by the way, that there would be no more battles with Quraysh after this, right? After Khandaq, that was it. It's Hudaybiyah, it's the Fath, and that's it. So Allah would will it as such. And then He says, Allahumma wa in kunta qad wala'tu al-harba baynana wa baynahum. And, oh Allah, if you have decreed that our war with Quraysh is over, then he says, فَجْعَلْهُ لِي shahada." Then let this be my moment of shahada. But, I mean, look at all of these conditions he's placing in his dua. He says, وَلَا تُبِتْنِي حَتَّى تُقِرَّ عَيْنِي مِنْ بَنِي قُرَيْضَ Do not let me die until I see the judgment of Bani Quraydah with my own eyes. This was his people, and this is you know, the tribe that he had an allyship with that betrayed the Prophet ﷺ from inside. So from his love of the Prophet ﷺ, I'm basically saying, Ya Allah, I want to go as a shaheed. But he's, I mean, most of us, we just ask for shahada and that's it, right? But the Siddiqun, SubhanAllah, these people like Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, look at their level of dua. Ya Allah, let me live to see the battle with Quraysh if that's still going to take place. And if it's not, then let me live to see the judgment of Banu Quraydah. After that, Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu became extreme. I mean, he was basically immobilized from that, that wound, right? And they set up a tent for him in the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu And Rasulullah sallallahu used to go and visit him every single day. And he would stay with him for a long time. He said the Prophet sallallahu used to rush to his tent. Like every day, like it was like the first thing that he wants to do, sallallahu alayhi He'd finish his salah and he'd go straight to the tent of Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Every single day to go and visit with him, to go and to sit with him, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And 
of course, what ends up happening after Khandaq, Jibreel alayhi salam comes to the Prophet sallallahu and he said that you have put down what you have put down, but we, the angels, are still continuing. وَأَشَارَ إِلَى بَنِي قُرَيْدَ And he told the Prophet ﷺ to proceed towards Banu Qurayza, towards the fortress of Banu Qurayza. Sa'ad radiallahu anhu did not live to actually fight against Banu Qurayza. Uh, of course, we know that the, the famous story that Allah gave the Prophet ﷺ victory after 25 days under the banner of Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. But essentially, once the Prophet ﷺ, you know, is granted victory over them, uh, they say to the Prophet Sallallahu they surrender and they say to the Prophet Sallallahu but we want a judge other than you. I mean, what kind of army under siege says we want someone other than you? Like, you know, they, they throw that back at the Prophet Sallallahu And the Prophet Sallallahu says that would you be happy with your Khalif Sa'ad bin Mu'ath, your ally Sa'ad bin Mu'ath? You want justice? Fine. You, I mean, they committed high treason. This is the highest order of treason. There is no code of ethics anywhere in the world, right? That would excuse what they did, and they had intentions to kill the men, women, and children, and to end the Muslims from inside, right? But the Prophet ﷺ says, would you be happy with Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh? And they said that we would be happy with Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, because he's the Khalif, he is our ally, we remember him, we trust him, he's a just man, and we have that relationship with him. So the Prophet ﷺ, when that message gets back to Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu uh, literally had to be carried over because of how little was left of his life. And while he's being carried, the hypocrites, the munafiqun, are surrounding him on his stretcher and trying to convince him, right, to betray the Prophet ﷺ or to, to mess this up. And Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, this is not the time that I, will be fe- that I will fear the blame of the blamer. This is not the time I'm going to betray my, uh, my, my, my position with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he continues forward. Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu is brought forth. And the Prophet says, Qumu li sayyidikum, stand for your leader. This is actually where this sentence comes from, that the people should stand for their Sayyid. So the Prophet affirms the rank of Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu. The people stand for Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu is then sat up and he says, are you all in agreement with me as the arbiter, as the, ju- as, as, as the judge in this regard? Banu Quraidah says, we are pleased. He's too shy to look directly at the Prophet He looks in the direction of the Muslims and he says, are you all pleased? And they said, Rasulullah says, yes. Go ahead and pass your judgment. So Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu gave the judgment that the men would be killed. Okay, which is by the way, the law of Deuteronomy, the law that they would have, been gone, that they would have gone by as well. And they thought that maybe the old tribal connection could get them out of this. Okay. And when he said that, they started to curse him and they started to, to yell at him. And the Prophet Sallallahu he said that the judgment of Sa'ad matched the judgment of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. that he judged righteously, that this was a situation. And you can't say the Prophet Sallallahu did not used to forgive his enemies. He used to do it all the time. But this situation was a different situation, right? So after that, Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu is taken back to his tent and within days, Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu dies. Within days of that. So his dua was answered as he said. He died a shaheed because he died from the wound that he suffered in Khandaq. Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu, they actually, the way they described, they saw the blood flowing from under the tent. And they knew that Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu had passed away. The Prophet sallallahu goes to him. And this is where you see the ultimate legacy of this man. And I elaborate it more in the episode that we have in Angels 2. I'm not saying that to be annoying. I'm saying that because I can't go into the full details of it now. But you go and you watch that episode and we talk about the presence of the Malaika, how many angels were present. But the main thing is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, اِهْتَزَّ عَرْشُ الرَّحْمَانِ لِمَوْتِ سَعَدِ بِنْ مُعَاذِ the throne of Allah, Ar-Rahman, just shook out of the death of Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad radiallahu ta'ala. How great of a human being do you have to be for the throne of Allah 
to shake at your death. Now, by the way, why did it shake? Farahan bihi. Out of joy of his soul returning because arwah al shuhada, the souls of the shuhada, are in chandeliers that are hanging from the arsh, from the throne of Ar Rahman. And so, you know, just like when Sa'ad walks in and everyone stands for their Sayyid, the shuhada are waiting to receive Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad. Ar Rahman is waiting to receive the soul of Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad. There is joy in the heavens, joy in the heavens for the reception of this man عنه, to the point that the throne of Ar Rahman, ihtazza, the throne of Ar Rahman shook out of joy of his return. And the Prophet وسلم, when they performed the janazah, they said that the body of Sa'ad, it was as if it was floating. They picked up his body and they felt no weight to it. And the hypocrites, what did they say? They mocked. They said that it's because he has no weight. They mocked him, like he's a man of no measure. Right? And the Prophet ﷺ said, that's because the ones that were carrying him were the malaika. You imagine the angels competing to carry the body of Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu to his burial. And the Prophet ﷺ led his janazah radiallahu ta'ala anhu. The man was only Muslim for six years. Five and a half, six years. And that's the thing, subhanAllah, that it, it is just, it is simply mind-blowing to think about the greatness of this man. To have been Muslim for that long and to have that virtue written for you like no other person. Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu. I'll give you one more incident. I know that we've gone uh, a little over time today. Uh, but this is, this shows you the, the powerful remembrance. You know, my favorite part of this again is always the aftermath. As'ad ibn Zurara, you know, people making dua for him years later, remembering the first time he established Jum'ah here. The Prophet ﷺ is standing up on the minbar, and the Prophet ﷺ was wearing a very nice garment that he had received uh, from a foreign emissary. And Rasulullah ﷺ, when someone would bring him a cloth from Abyssinia, from Yemen, from different places, the Messenger ﷺ would wear it. So this happened to be the nicest garment that they ever saw the Prophet ﷺ wear. So the Prophet ﷺ comes out on the day of Jum'ah, and they, the Sahaba literally started to feel on his garment, and they were saying, Ya Rasulullah. This is, a, this is an incredible garment. This is a beautiful cloth. And Rasulullah did not used to buy these types of clothes, right? When the foreign emissaries brought it, the Prophet accepted the gift, he wore it. And that was a way of validating a people, that was a way of validating a friendship and a relationship, right? So it was the nicest thing they ever saw the Prophet wearing. And what does the Prophet say? And this is, subhanAllah, I mean, this is where you don't just freeze these people in history, but you take the concept of it. Rasulullah said, do you think this garment is, 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 is worth anything? And the Prophet says, فَوَاللَّهِ I swear by Allah. لَمَنَادِيلُ سَعَدْ فِي الْجَنَّةِ The handkerchief of Sa'ad in Jannah, أَحْسَنُ مِمَّا تَرَوْنَ is better than the stope. The little handkerchief of Sa'ad in Jannah is better than the stope. Like, don't get deluded by this stuff, right? That man, what Allah has blessed him with, is so much greater than anything else that you could pursue in this world. The Prophet Sallallahu praising that, reminding us that you seek status with Ar-Rahman, you seek status with the Most Merciful, the way that Sa'ad ibn Mu'ayyad did with the Most Merciful. SubhanAllah, he could have, he could have easily taken a route like Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul said, I'm the leader, if, if this man comes, I lose all my claims to leadership, right? Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad had a lot to lose by bringing in the Prophet Sallallahu He could have reasonably been amongst those that competed for the throne of a kingdom that would be made for Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Sarur that he would want to fight. He could have made that claim that I will be the king of Yathrib. And he relinquished that throne for the sake of Allah. And who did he become? The man for whom the throne of Allah shook. If that's not a lesson, I don't know what is. وَالْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ وَأَبْقَى And the hereafter is better and everlasting. رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَىٰ عَنْ سَعَدْ May Allah have mercy and be pleased with uh, Sa'ad رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَىٰ عَنْهُ Elevate him, elevate his rank. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to have a fate where we are amongst the righteous souls and amongst those who are in chandeliers hanging from the throne of Ar Rahman, amongst those whose handkerchiefs in Jannah, whose clothes in Jannah are their adornment that they seek. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be amongst these companions, amongst the righteous, amongst the prophets. 
and what a wonderful companionship that would be. Allahumma ameen. Inshallah ta'ala, next week we'll talk about Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. And then you get the whole picture of Medina. So you go into Ramadan, inshallah ta'ala, with a full picture of what brought Islam to Medina. If you know these men, so again, Mus'ab ibn Umair, As'ad ibn Zurara, Usaid ibn Hudayr, Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, and then one more, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. Through these five people, Islam completely engulfs uh, the city of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, inshallah ta'ala, go ahead and take a few questions. I'll make it short. If you have questions, then you can ask me afterwards. But I'll take one question from each side, inshallah. Uh, and then that way, those of you who brought your kids, I apologize for going longer tonight. Uh, you can, you can inshallah ta'ala, leave. So any questions? One from the sisters, one from the brothers. Yep. Yeah. Um, Um, it's a little bit of both, so it's the importance to, um, to speak about the handkerchief of, uh, of Sa'ad and his position, or is the importance to uh, de-emphasize extravagant clothing and things of that sort. The Prophet ﷺ was never extravagant. And extravagance is to wear something that's haram, to wear something that is forbidden in its nature, to, uh, to set negative trends in society, to wear clothing that humiliates other people. There, there are a lot of different things when it comes to extravagance. So the Prophet ﷺ himself, again, never used to buy extravagant clothes, had very simple clothing, ﷺ. Um, it is part of a familiar theme that the Prophet ﷺ did not want his companions to associate success with worldly possession. So similar to when Umar ibn Khattab anhu entered in to the uh, home of the Prophet ﷺ and saw him get up and he had, his bed was made of branches and uh, you know, he didn't have a bed, right? The Prophet ﷺ basically slept on branches and his, uh, his pillow ﷺ was leather just stuffed with some fibers. And Umar anhu cried because he said, I've seen the palaces of Rome. I've seen the palaces of Kisra and Persia. Ya Rasulullah, you deserve so much more than those people deserve. And the Prophet ﷺ says to him, Ama tarla, ya Umar, aren't you pleased, O Umar? And Allahum dunya wa lana al they have this world, we have the hereafter. So it's part of a familiar theme that the Prophet ﷺ is emphasizing that true success is not in this world, true success is found with Allah. And basically, Continue on the way of Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu because that's where you're going to find the great blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So continue to pursue what Sa'ad radiallahu anhu pursued of the hereafter. What makes this narration unique is that the Prophet sallallahu could have said a handkerchief in Jannah is greater than this dope. But he specified sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the handkerchief of Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh because Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh literally relinquished you know, the positioning of this world and the possessions of this world for that place in paradise. And of course the scholars mention you know, that uh, the Prophet ﷺ does not speak without knowledge that he would have to have been informed either through vision or if some way of what the handkerchief of Sa'ad is in Jannah. So either the Prophet ﷺ saw that of him in a Jannah or was informed of it through, uh, through his connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the angels. Okay, so the balance is that you choose what is modest. Allah loves that his blessing shows on a person. There are certain uh, occasions where Allah loves to see uh, the adornment of a believer on them. So you choose what is a balance. If you have the ability to do so, then you can buy things that are, um, you know, that are not extravagant, and it is subjective, right? You're not gonna get a dollar amount out of a hadith, okay? So things that are halal, things that do not uh, you know, transgress the boundaries of what is halal, what is permissible, and also things that are reserved for certain occasions but do not, do not set negative trends in society. 
so that's subjective, and it's something that you, you kind of have to go back to your heart in that regard when it comes to the, the gray area of this. Uh, there's a difference between wearing a suit and you know wearing a suit with, uh, with diamonds on it or something like that, right? Like, there are, there are things that would clearly transgress the bounds of what is considered appropriate and elegant for an occasion in a society and a culture, and clearly be looked at as having gone a little bit overboard. So that's where you know that you've gone overboard, but generally speaking, the modest and the permissible, inshallah. All right, any questions from the sisters? I held you all too long tonight. I know it's a weeknight. Jazakumullah khairan. Subhanakallah. Alhamdulillah. Ashhadu wa da'ilan. Tastakhiru ta'ala.